Hello, I'm Will Smith, and welcome to Citizens Forum. We're recording this on Tuesday, December 17th, and uh, I'd like to thank the Shaw staff and our volunteers for helping us to get this production together. Today, my first guest is David Murner, and David is with Fair Vote Canada, and we're going to be talking about proportional representation. And as you all, I'm sure, are no doubt aware, there's an election going on right now to decide about this topic. And David is going to tell us a little bit about what's been happening over the past few months. So well, thank thanks you. Thanks for coming, David. Thank you for having me. Yeah. yeah. We really are at a key time right now because we should know within the next week or so what the results are. And looking back, it's been a long, long campaign, a long referendum campaign uh, with lots of developments during the campaign. But nobody really knows right now who's going to win. Uh, the polls suggest it's going to be close, um, mm. and that it has been a very tough fought and, and, and uh, difficult referendum campaign, but we're at the point now, at the end of it, of just wondering, what's the result going to be? Have you been working on this full time? I haven't been working on it full time, but I've been putting a lot of time in, and there are literally thousands and thousands of British Columbians who have been knocking on doors and making phone calls and sending emails about the campaign especially on the yes side, the change side. Uh -huh. A lot of us have been working long hours, not full time, but um, long hours. And our sense is that that might make the difference, that it's going to be close, but we have a shot of winning partly because of what we call the ground game. Well, what, can you tell us a little bit about the dynamics of the situation and how it's changed? I mean, I imagine that just being that close to it, you've seen a lot happen. Yeah, so. we have seen a lot. and. Uh, we, there's a lot on social media as well, which is a new thing. We've had referendums in, in BC before. We've had two referendums on proportional representation before. But this one was different because it was done in the social media era. There was a lot of negative advertising, especially from the no side, you mm. know, uh, images of jackbooted Nazis and uh, all these <laughs> extremists who are going to take over. Uh, so the no, no side really used a lot of strong social media images to say, don't vote for proportional representation. The Yes side also had a big, strong social media campaign, but mm -hmm. we also focused on just getting out the vote and getting people informed on the doorsteps and informed through social media about what the issues were. And then, especially, fill in your ballot and send it in. So what do you think the, the uh, understanding is? Do you, do you think that the public has a good idea of the difference between the, the system that we have right now and the proportional system? Looking back, I think that actually the no side did have a good point when they said this is complicated. Uh, the second question out of the two questions, you know, was a complicated question. There's no way around yes. it. It laid out these three proportional representation options. Each one of them takes a little bit of studying to understand. And Elections BC put out a good booklet, but I think just from my door knocking, I'd say that most British Columbians really struggled to figure out what are these systems, how do they work, um, and many people felt, you know, this is, this is hard to understand. Well, you had uh, two questions, though. The first question is just whether or not to use proportional representation, and then the other one was the three different systems. Yeah. So the idea that I got, or you know, my for my uh, voting, I did some research on proportional representation mm -hmm. systems, and really, I just I, I uh, figured that I would look at countries that had it, and I liked yeah. what I saw. Yeah. And I'd spoken to Richard Habgood, <laughs> so he, you know, he gave me a lot of good information. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing, the the other part of it, I didn't really worry about so much yet because I figured that what once we get the proportional representation, and if that happens, yeah. then then there's more time to talk about the other three systems. But <laughs> Yeah. So what's, uh, can you what'll, comment on that? What will happen next, actually, is that uh, the, there, an all-party committee of the Legislative Assembly of British Columbia will sit down. And I think they'll be looking at the results. Um, the polling suggests that the mixed member proportional is likely to win as, mm -hmm. as the option. So assuming that there's a yes vote and we do move to a new system, and assuming mixed member proportional is the winning um, uh, choice of British Columbians in terms of the three systems. Then what the committee will do is go through and figure out all the details. Uh, you know, details like how many members of the Legislative Assembly will we have? How many more will we add? Um, what will it look like in terms of regional 
uh, regional um, MLAs and uh, local MLAs because mixed member has two types of MLA, right? right? So there'll be a lot of detailed questions like that for the members of the legislati Legislative Assembly to look at. And um, there'll also be some issues, I think, around how do we engage British Columbians in this next conversation, right? Uh, right. There are lots of other issues to be decided, but a lot of people are saying it shouldn't just be the politicians deciding these things. We should have more input now that the politicians are getting into the details. So I think they'll be working on that as well. So would it, will it come to another vote eventually if we have proportional representation? Uh, will it come to another vote de deciding which system or is that something that will be decided without? That'll be basically uh, the referendum result. Assuming there's a yes on the first question, we want proportional representation, and secondly, one of those three options gets a majority, which is very likely, then yes. it'll, it'll be that, that one that's the choice, and there'll be a lot of detail work on it. So there won't I be see. another referendum on it, but there will be a chance for the public to give input into the legislative process of this all-party committee. Okay, well, what other insights do you have about, you know, what's going on with this? Have you, has your uh, view of this changed over time yourself? I think one of the things people like me uh, who are involved in Fair Vote Canada and really care about these issues tend to underestimate is that we think, you know what, this stuff, you can learn it from the Elections BC uh, workbook. You can figure these things out. But it was really clear that a lot of British Columbians were puzzled at the start. Um, didn't know there was a referendum on until quite a long ways into the whole thing. And then by the end, we're probably still pretty puzzled about the three uh, options. So the big learning for me is it, this is a technical issue. And I wonder if referenda are the appropriate way to figure this stuff out. In the mm. past, we've had a citizens assembly where they actually put together a group of randomly selected citizens to really study these issues and figure out w what's the what are the ins and outs of all these things? And I think maybe looking back on it, the citizens assembly process might be better for a technical thing like this than a referendum where all sorts of scare tactics can come up, you know, the, as I mentioned earlier, the, the Nazis and so on. And we saw this in, in the UK with Brexit, right? right? There's a lot of things that can happen in a referendum campaign. Politicians are good at campaigning and shaping public opinion to their own ends. And I'm not sure you always get to the best answer with a referendum some sort of other process, maybe a citizen's assembly or, you know, uh, a different way of engaging the public would probably have been better. So what do you see, what if, uh, what if it doesn't pass? What if we are with the first pass the post system, what do you? That's a, a great question, Will. I think what this means, and a lot of your viewers aren't going to be happy to hear this, but we're on to the next referendum campaign. We'll be starting, people like Faribault Canada will say, all right, we probably came close, but you know what? We'll do it next time. And so the lobbying will start and people will start working with the party leaders and saying, hey, look, we should do something here. Um, because fundamentally, a lot of British Columbian believe we can do better with our democracy. Look at how Germany or New Zealand sure. or all these other countries are working so, so much better. And the other thing people are saying, especially now, is these first-past-the-post systems, Canada, United States, uh, the United Kingdom, these are countries where the, the democracy is in tough shape. You get people like... Trump or um, Harper in there, they control 100% of the power, they don't even have 50% of the votes. People are saying it's time for change, and that's not going to stop. Are there any other, are there any other alternatives that, that uh, you would, might think are viable? Because I've, since moving here, I've uh, tracked a couple of other things. Uh, I, I watched a, a movie or a video that really uh, sort of snapped my attention. It was called Cascadia occupied or something like that where there's sort of yeah. an independence movement for this bio region yeah. and then I read another one that's uh, that would combine Alberta and British Columbia yeah. that's local in but Canada I mean yeah. do you think that those movements might be viable or do you because I do see a lot a huge difference because my exposure to Canada in my before coming to, to Victoria was that Ontario was Canada right and yeah. it's so obviously yeah. completely different here so yeah. I'm just curious if you you know, if it, if it doesn't pass, I, I don't know. I have no feeling yeah. for whether or not it's going to pass. I, 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 don't, I don't think there'll be um, sort of a separation movement or anything like that. But I do think that uh, one of the things about proportional representation is that populist movements, I think, have a harder time 
seizing power in proportional representation systems because um, even though they might have a voice in the legislature, the extremist parties find it hard to, to, to go into government in coalition with larger parties. You look mm. at Germany where they do have a right-wing extremist problem they, and, uh, and they are electing people like that to their legislature, but they never get into government, same in Holland because the mainstream parties won't touch them, right? Right. Uh, I do worry, though, that people like Rob Ford are getting elected, uh, or sorry, Doug Ford are getting elected, <laughs> that was a slip, in Ontario, <laughs> um, on sort of 39 or 40% of the vote. And we could see that happening again federally, too. So there, I think this will be an ongoing issue, but I don't think Canadians will go to the point of saying, okay, we'll have a Western separation movement. In fact, in Quebec, uh, they're moving towards proportional representation this year without a referendum, just legislation. So, oh, really? Yeah, so Quebec is actually ahead, could be ahead of us. It depends on the outcome of BC's referendum, but uh, Quebec's moving ahead. I think we'll see PEI move ahead as well with proportional representation. So uh, this isn't dead yet, and if it passes in BC, then we'll be leaders in Canada. Right. Yeah. Oh, so, okay, so... Excuse me for being ignorant about this, no. but I don't even know if there are there any uh, provinces that already have proportional. No, there it, aren't. No, so it's uh, all first past so the post. It's so a far. race to be the leader, and uh, I, if if we win, if this referendum passes, then uh, BC is likely to actually pass the, the, its legislation first and hold the first proportional representation referendum uh, in Canada. Oh, really and, interesting. Yeah, and then if we don't, if it doesn't pass this week, then Quebec is likely to be the first, and PEI is likely to be the second. Have you uh, spoken personally to any of the legislators in BC about uh, their attitudes towards PR and what what they see happening? I, I, I that have. Would be an interesting uh, it, topic. It, it's a hugely sensitive topic for people <laughs> in politics because it's about who gets to control the power, right? Right. And it's going to make a huge impact, especially on the BC Liberals. The BC Liberals, one of the reasons they were so strongly opposed, is that they won't be able to form government uh, on forty percent of the vote. But not only that their party is likely to fracture because that's a coalition party with a lot of pretty right-wing conservatives in it and then some middle-of-the-road liberals you know uh, who are not that socially conservative and you can already see the BC conservatives get winning seats in the next election if we have proportional representation so that coalition of sort of the right and um, sort of middle right is likely to break up and, uh, interesting. Yeah, so very interesting for the Liberals. On the left, the NDP uh, uh, um, uh, is not likely to break up, but they're going to be looking for partners like they have now to form a majority, right? And so they'll be turning to the Greens. I think the Greens are in a fantastic situation if proportional representation passes because they're likely to get more seats and they're likely to be the, the kingmaker in the oh, legislature. Yeah. So the political dynamics of this will really change if proportional representation goes through. Okay, we've only got a minute left, and I just have one more question. Uh, because when uh, Trudeau was elected, he one of the things that he said was that you know proportional representation was something that he was going to yes. work on yeah. for Canada. And then, yeah. then he had that uh, when he announced that that wasn't the right yeah. thing for Canada. And yeah. there was when I came in here, I have never seen such a bunch of of whipped puppies in my life. Everybody's just dragging and, yeah. and really disappointed. Yeah. So could you comment on why that happened? I'd be glad to comment. I ran for the federal liberals last time in 2015. I was a candidate here in Esquimalt Sanders suit. And that was one of the reasons I was so pleased to be a liberal was because we'd made this great commitment for this major change. And so it was very disappointing. Um, I think he was worried about not being able to form government with 40% of the power. And Let me see. Typical, uh, uh, typical change of heart for politicians who want to keep power. Well, that's been very interesting. We're out of time, but thank you very much for coming on the show, David. I really appreciate your comments, and we Thanks, let's sir. hope to see a favorable outcome in the next week or so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Hello, and welcome back to Citizens Forum. Again, this is Tuesday, the 18th of December, 2018, and my guest in this segment is Andrew Hunter. And Andrew has been on the show before, most recently about JFK, I think it was on the last show. And since he was on this show, and I didn't really know that much about the JFK incident because I was about eight years old when it happened, I can still remember I was on the monkey bars when I heard it. Everybody can remember where they were. But uh, I went home and I talked to my wife and we decided to watch Oliver Stone's movie, JFK, which is about three hours long. So we broke it up into two sessions. 
And I was just, I couldn't stop thinking about it. It, it just sort of haunted me for days that, that the world uh, that I w was brought up in in the United States had changed drastically in 1963 and, uh, and essentially there had been a coup and that uh, the power shift was from uh, a, an elected, somebody who went through the normal election process to somebody who was installed, just basically installed by, <laughs> perhaps you can tell us who, but anyway, we can go on from there and perhaps uh, find out a little bit more information about George Bush the first, who uh, was also probably partaking in some of this, these operations, right? That is correct, Will. Um, in remembering George H.W. Bush, uh, like the world did, I think there's some other aspects to his life and his times that should be analyzed. Uh, namely, the fact that, uh, you know, he was an oil man to begin with when he moved to Texas from Connecticut in 1953. But he set up Z Zapata Petroleum, which was a oil company which was used as a cover for the, for the CIA. And you could imagine having offshore drilling platforms in the Gulf of Mexico in the late 50s, early 60s would give you incredible scope in terms of the things that could, you could do and what you could assist doing, namely the transport of drugs. Ah, so it's a lot of drug money too. Especially coming through Central America, that's correct. Even back as far as 1963? That is, that is correct. Well, um, just to continue the JFK story, the, um, George Bush did write a memo to the FBI on behalf of his company, Zapata Petroleum. So that's in the record and that's known. So for some reason, he was in Dallas that day on November 22nd, 1963. Not surprising considering he was, there he was in Dallas in 19, in, on November 22nd. And that's 22nd. a fact. That's, an that's a fact, yes. Wow. So... Um, the Zapata, Zapata Petroleum was the cover that he used, which is not unusual. In my previous appearance, I mentioned that the, 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 the post-World War II world, the intelligence people, the military people, the agent provocateurs went underground and set up a business front. Now, that's what George Bush did. Hmm. As soon as he left Connecticut and went down to Texas, he set up a oil company as a front for CIA activities, related to activities, namely the uh, Bay of Pigs in 1961, which was totally anti-Castro Cubans who were trained in Louisiana and then were sent over in the failed uh, landing in Cuba. And of course, JFK was taken out because one of the reasons being he, he didn't supply air support for, the, the, for those anti-Castro Cubans mm -hmm. that were trained in Louisiana, which were part of the intelligence industry uh, build up after the Second World War. Wow. So he he uh, was in the, he was already involved in the CIA. When did he when did he start working? For well, he the started. CIA? I, I, I I I imagine it was 1953. Okay. That's when Zapata Petroleum was set up. Uh. And uh, so Bush himself, the Bush the first, uh, obviously transitioned from oil into uh, other areas. As we know, he became. Uh, he ran for Congress twice and lost, and then he uh, eventually ended up being um, this, the ambassador, the UN ambassador for the, uh, for the U.S., and also to China, and then director of the CIA in 1976-77. So you could imagine when he was hired by Ford in 76, what would make him, what, what, what experience would Bush have as yeah. director of the CIA, unless he actually was one. So he, wouldn't, he wasn't hired from outside the loop, he was I already see. inside the loop. He was already, but he was undercover. He back, was undercover way back then. But he first became actually visible as uh, in the CIA in 1976. In 76, okay. when he was appointed, appointed by President Ford. Wow. And um, obviously, in those era, in in the in the 70s, a lot was going on, especially in Central America. And uh, certainly, we look at today's problems with the, the 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 caravan that was arriving at the Mexican border was mostly Honduras, mostly Hondurans, and of course. The history of Honduras recently has been a tragedy, but it's just another chapter in the verse in the verses of U.S. intervention and their um, activities in Central and South America, which Bush obviously was part of, starting in 1953. So, for instance, in Guatemala in 1954, they had the coup that took out the democratically elected uh, president Arbenz, 
that was a CIA sponsored coup, courtesy President Eisenhower and Alan Dulles and the United Fruit Company. So oh. that's when the things started heating up was the early 50s. And of course, that was just a year after the coup in Ira Iran. Iran right. was a um, democratically uh, elected, had a democratically elected prime minister in uh, 1953 named Mossadegh. And he was going to nationalize uh, the petroleum industry. And of course, the Anglo, -Petro the Anglo Iranian petroleum industry didn't, wouldn't, didn't like that. The CIA intervened and, and put in the, the Shah. Lobby. So you can see that the, the actions were heating up in the early 50s. And of course, Bush, having started Zapata in 53, was part of that action, namely Iran 1953, Guatemala 1954, and so on from there. Yeah, I guess I think of the, the very public thing in Nicaragua that happened uh, uh, with uh, guns and uh, drugs. Well, the Iran-Contra, that's yeah. correct. Well, listen, uh, that's one of the many blemishes on, on Bush's record that is, is, was never analyzed and should be analyzed. The arm, arms for hostage, the, you know, the hostages and the Contra funding. And of course, if you watched uh, for, for movie buffs, if you're a JFK movie buff, Another movie you should see is called American Made with Tom Cruise. It talks American about Made. Barry Seal, who was a pilot for the CIA, and he was the one that was reporting to Bush, and he was transporting the drugs once he dropped the arms off. So it, you, you can imagine when you're, when you're transporting something, you want to perhaps refill the plane with something. So the drugs were being taken down to Central America by CIA pilots and CIA-covered planes, and of course they would return uh, with arms, so um, that's that, and of course Bush Bush Senior was was involved heavily involved in that as well, because Barry Seal has said that he, in the movie at least, which is part of his narrative, that he used to report to, uh, he saw Bush at a cocktail party in Guatemala Guatemala City, or I think it was El Salvador, and of course he was there to check out to make sure things were going all right, and uh, Bush also ran a very racist campaign. Those, those of us with short memories in the, in the political process would have forgotten that G George Bush ran a blatantly racist campaign showing a picture of Willie Horton. Everyone, you ever heard yeah. of Willie Horton? Willie Horton was the black prisoner who was let off for early release. Uh, I think it was in Massachusetts. And Bush ran ads saying, portraying Willie Horton as a renegade criminal who's out there terrorizing the neighborhood and it's all because of Michael Dukakis, and that was the most effective tool that Bush used to, to defeat Michael Dukakis, and Michael mm -hmm. Dukakis never, 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 uh, never came back from that. And I've also, um, so that was 1988, uh, so that's after, well, that's after the Iran-Contra affair. In 1989, you and I talked about it before, Bush led invaded Panama. Now, what was that all about? Yeah. You would say this is this is before the Iraq. This is before Iraq and Kuwait. I mean, the guy going is going around the world, terrorizing people. So uh, Panama, what was that all about? He sends in the U.S. Army to invade this poor country, and kills a number of civilians. And what is he trying to do? He's trying to dislodge Manuel Noriega, right? The CIA appointed drug runner, drug uh, nar narco trafico, who, who, who's who's um, the president of Panama. He, uh, Noriega disagreed. He wasn't going to toe the CIA line. Right. So what happened was Bush mm -hmm. said he's got to go. And as you remember, they, they transported him to Florida. And, of course, he was there in jail for many years and no one heard anything. Yeah. And you sort of wonder why did we never hear about Manuel Noriega in 1989? And then fast forward to Kuwait. We get the, the you know, Operation Desert Storm and we get the Kuwaiti the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador going to the UN saying the Iraqis are stealing the babies from the, you know, the right, baby. Remember, remember, the remember that story? Right. And of course, that lady was put up by the, by <laughs> Hillen the, the Yeah. And so you can see there's a number of blemishes on George Bush's record, which should be acknowledged and uh, recounted. I lived in Panama for a couple of years and uh, that uh, operation was known as, it was called Just Cause, because, yeah. but in, locally in Panama, the, the uh, Americans I knew there called it Operation Just Cause, and there were a lot of people killed that were not accounted for. I, it, I took a, 
a tour with a friend of mine to a Panamanian friend of mine to see everything that had gone on and it was it was uh, I was amazed that the United States kind of got away with that you know because they were <laughs> it was upsetting for them I mean to have pe just a lot of people killed there well was it was very upsetting I mean you've got a history with Panama and so do I I, I was working in Panama uh, in, in the late 70s and uh, I was actually working there in 1979 when the Shah of Iran turned up so I was uh, just as a good story uh, Will uh, I was living at the Panama Hilton in 1979, and I said to my parents before I left, I, I said to them, I bet you that the Shah of Iran is going to turn up in Panama, because <laughs> Carter was looking for a place to put him for self safekeeping. And, and, and I came down from my room and went into the lobby of the Panama Hilton, and there was the Shah of Iran. And how old were you? Uh, well, I was 29, but I was wow. working there. And so CNN came up to me and said, what do you think about the Shah of Iran being in, 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 in Panama and how it's going to affect you. And what had happened was I wasn't really that versed with international media, so I said to them, people are concerned about their safety, but there's nothing to worry about. So the media said, they took the first half of my statement, but didn't mention the second half. Right. So I lost my job because the Shah of Iran turned up in Panama in 1979. And so I left in, in early January of 1979 because the Shah of Iran was living on an island the Contador Islands, where I was uh, work working. So I was actually li living and working on Contador Island with the Shah's family. So wow. that's, what, that's my opinion. That's why I felt so sad about what happened in 89. Because I know what Panama's like, and I, and I love the Panamanian people. And that's why it was so sad that Bush went in there and did what he did. Yeah, I liked Panama too. I really had a, a good time living in Panama. And it's quite easy for us as North Americans to live there because they're used to us. I mean, <laughs> running the Panama Canal for Americans for a hundred years, I mean, having the Americans there for a hundred years really, you know, made them get along with Americans very well. And so. as you know, or might recall, there was the treaty, right? The Panama Canal Zone Treaty between Carter and Torrijos, which right. was, gave the rights to the Panama Canal Zone back to Panama. And General Torrijos, who I met in 1979, was killed in a plane crash in 1981. So the control of the Panama Canal Zone was never really going to be let from the U.S. to Panama. It always wanted to be kept. So that was a total facade, what happened there. So really, it's all in all a very tragic time in Panama, and that's why I, I feel so. I feel it should be mentioned in terms of what Bush did in 1989, because yeah. it wasn't what it's supposed to be. He wasn't dislodging a dictator and putting in a... He was just trying to get rid of someone who wouldn't cooperate with him. And uh, that's why it was so tragic. Well, how is this, how is this uh, situation? We've only got a minute left, but can you give us any hope for these situations that things are going to get better for our, uh, for our politics? Well, I, I guess uh, the, the, the hope is, uh, I would say the hope is uh, the yellow vest in France. I think it's incredible what they've done. Uh, that's a people protest from the ground up, and it's obviously made Mac Macron change his direction. And I think that's people power at its best. And I think that's what we have to do is, is deliver the truth and, uh, and, and mention it when it's not being told to us from the official, official sources. I'm absolutely with you there. I think that uh, finding out the truth is something that we all need to spend some time on, especially since we live in a democracy. That's a requirement for a democracy to go forward. So thank you very much, Andrew, for coming on the show. I really appreciate it and hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Will. And thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Hello, and welcome back to Citizens Forum. We're recording this on Tuesday, December 18th, 2018, and I'd like to thank our lovely volunteers and the Shaw staff for helping us put this production together again. And today I have an interesting guest, a local author, Garnet Schulhauser and he will talk about his uh, books that he's written and also an interesting technique for a healing modality called QHHT, which is quantum healing hypnosis technique. Quantum healing hypnosis technique. I tend to s switch the two H's around. But um, anyway, without further ado, welcome to the show, Garnet, and uh, I'd like you to tell us how did you get started in this from your career as a corporate attorney in Alberta? Well, it started way back in uh, 2007 when I was still practicing law. 
and I was walking down the street one day in, in Calgary. I was practicing law in Calgary. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a homeless man just jumped out in front of me. And he looked like a typical homeless man with like a dirty slept in clothes and scraggly beard and, and long unkept hair. <clears throat> but he was different because he had these amazing, dazzling, sparkling blue eyes. And I felt, at, at, I felt two things. First of all, I felt that he was looking right down into the depths of my soul. And I felt that he knew everything about me, everything I've ever said or done in my life. He even knew my deepest and darkest secrets, which was funny because I'd never met the man before. But instead of uh, stepping around him or, or getting away from him, I stood there because he was sending me this gaze. His eyes were sending me this, this gush of pure, unconditional love. Wow. It was infusing my whole body with an amazing sense of peace and security and well-being. It was like the most amazing feeling I've ever had in my life. And I just, and I enjoyed it. I was standing there like a deer caught in the headlights until he broke the spell by saying to me, why are you here? Then he promptly disappeared into a nearby store. But when I finally collected my wits, I went into the store to find him. And there was only one entrance and one exit. I walked in the store, he was nowhere to be seen. I walked back out in the street, up and down for several blocks trying to find him, but he had disappeared into thin air. So that, that evening I resolved to myself that I had to go back and try to find him the next day. And so I did. Same time, same street, I went to the, the place where I had met him before, walked up and down for a few blocks. I was about to give up and lose hope when I spotted him sitting on a bench all by himself. So I walked up to him and I said, who are you and why did you stop me the other day? And he said, I'm a soul just like you. I'm here to answer your questions and help you on your journey. And then my skeptical lawyer brain kicked in. <laughs> and I said to him, why do you think you could help me when you can't even help yourself? Because you look like you've been sleeping on the street for weeks and you smell like a dead fish. <laughs> well, he cracks me this big smile and he says, you know, looks can be deceiving because you look like you're a very successful corporate lawyer with everything under control. But we both know that's just a facade. He said, You've been asking yourself all the big questions in life over the last number of years, and you haven't found the answers yet. He says, if you want to find your answers, sit down and chat with me. And if you don't want to do that, then go back to your office and see if you can find your answers and all those emails waiting for you on your computer. Well, luckily, my intuition was screaming at me to say, sit down and talk to this guy. What do I have to lose? Half an hour of my life? So I sat down and we began a conversation that ended up uh, going and continuing off and on for about the next several months. And he told me early on his name was Albert and he was one of my spirit guides in disguise. And I found out later that I was the only one who ac could actually see him or touch him. I could feel him. He was, he was solid. He told me that, it, that no one else could have seen him that day, only me. And so if somebody had been passing by the bench that day, they would have seen me sitting by myself, talking to myself, apparently, because they couldn't see Albert. And so he showed up in, in the homeless man manifestation for the first three times. And then after that, he was just a voice in my head and we communicated by telepathy. Now, did anybody think you were nuts when you started having these experiences? Well, or? I never told anyone. You never told anyone. I, I, didn't, I didn't even tell my wife. Were I, you afraid to tell people? Yes, I was. I was afraid to tell my wife and my sons and certainly I wasn't going to tell my law partners. They would have had me hauled away in a straitjacket, <laughs> you know. So there's no way I was telling anyone. And okay. so I had this, this, this private conversation that went on for the, off and on for a year. Um, and uh, about, about a year after I, I uh, f first met him, um, I decided, you know, practicing law was just not for me anymore and that I had to set off on a different course of action. And so a year after I met Albert, I retired from the law, moved out to Vancouver Island, and I began uh, writing the manuscript for my first book, Dancing on a Stamp. And, and, and the reason I wrote the book was because Albert said early on in our conversation, mm -hmm. he said, I'm not just here to satisfy your curiosity. I want you to buy, write a book about my revelations so that everyone would have access to them. And that sort of took me back a bit because I had not not even dreamed of writing a book. It wasn't on my radar screen. Uh, but he's very gently persuasive. And after a while, I agreed, okay, I'm going to write the book. And so I wrote the, the manuscript for my first book. How long did that take book. you? Quite a while. It probably took me maybe a year and a half. It was slow going. I, I, I wasn't used to being an author and I, I would write drafts and I, I, I think I rewrote the manuscript like eight or nine times Wow! Uh, before I decided to, to, to find a, a, a publisher. But even after I finished the manuscript, I was, I was hesitant and I thought, you know, if I publish this book, I'm going to lose a lot of my old friends. A lot of my law colleagues are going to think I'm crazy. 
I wasn't sure what my family was going to think about it. And so I, I struggled with that for quite a while. Then finally I said, to heck with it. I'm going to get it published, let the chips fall where they may. And, and so then I saw the publisher. And when, what, what year was that? I got the publisher, uh, an offer to publish in December of 2011, and it was published, released in September of 2012. So you've been on Vancouver Island since 2010 or so, and then... Oh, actually, 2008. Oh, 2008, yeah. wow. Yeah, yeah. I, di I didn't get at writing the manuscript right away, and once I started, it took okay. a while, so... It was just, you know, Albert had to sort of sometimes hit me over the head with a two-by-four <laughs> to get me going. Well, that's fascinating. Now, how did you get involved then with uh, the QHHT? Did that sort of naturally follow? Y yeah. See, what happened was the publisher for my, well, all four of my books um, is Ozark Mountain Publishing. Oh, okay. And, and the founding um, uh, person for that publishing company is Dolores Cannon. And so I was, I spoke, I've been in Arkansas three times to speak at their transformation conference. I met Dolores once she passed away in 2014 mm -hmm. um, and I was aware that she had this program called QHHT sort of generally vaguely aware but I didn't really pay much attention to it when I finished the manuscript from my fourth book I said to my spirit guide Albert so what should I do now should I write book five what do you want me to do he says put book five on the back burner for now I want you to take the QHHT course and it's sort of like you know the light bulb went on I thought yeah that makes sense so I took the, the two courses, I took level one and I took level two, so now I'm a level two practitioner. And c can you uh, give us a, an overview of QHHT? Yeah, it's, it's a hypnosis technique developed by Dolores Cannon, who is the founder of my publishing company. And she developed this over a period of like 40 years and, she, and, and, and kept on changing it and perfecting it. And uh, what it is basically is it, it puts the clients into a very deep trance the, the called the, the theta level of trance, the deepest level you can go. And, and, and from there, there's two aspects to the, uh, to the induction. When a client goes into the induction, the first thing is they go back to one or more past lives. And it could be a past life they had on Earth, could even be a past life on another planet. Uh, and so they go through, and, and when they're in the past life, they're actually reliving the past life. So they're actually, whatever they're seeing, doing, whatever's happening to them, it's sort of like they're reliving it. So it can get quite emotional sometimes. If, you know, I've had clients who, you know, with tears streaming down their cheeks because they're, uh, they're, they're seeing their wedding day or the birth of their first child or whatever. It could be tears of joy or tears of grief, whatever. When that's done, then we get to the good part, which is we, we summon their higher self. Now, a person's higher self is sort of the highest part of a person's soul most, collectly, most closely aligned to the, to the source, okay? Mm -hmm. Higher self has been with, your higher self has been with you right from day one uh, when you were born and also knows everything about all your previous lives. And they're there to help you. They, they want you to uh, have a, a fulfilling journey, the one that you intended to have before you, uh, before you incarnated. And so when we get to the higher self, the client brings in, at our request, a list of questions. And we ask, uh, and, and as a practitioner, I'll ask the higher self the questions and get the answers. And it's all recorded so that the client, after the session, can listen to it and, and get all the answers. And so and, and the answers, are, the questions could be anything. It could be relationship. It could be like, when am I going to find my life partner? How do I find my life partner? It could be career, like uh, should I stay with my job? Should I change my career? What city should I live in? Uh, it could be health issues. It could be like, why do I have this pain in my stomach that n the doctors can't figure out? Uh, you know, why, why do I have recurring dreams throughout my life? Why were there missing segments in some part of my life that, um, that I can't explain? So questions like that, and they get really good answers from their higher self. And I, I'd like to say here that uh, I met Garnet by doing one of these sessions, and you successfully regressed me back to several previous lives. And it's, uh, a friend of mine asked me, you know, well, do you believe in that stuff? And I said, well, it's really hard to, to say. I, I know that I experienced something that was amazing, and I, I know that I saw things that were real, and I felt like I was there. And so... While I don't, I, I can't say that I have a new belief system entirely because of this. It's sort of, it's like it opened the door. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's something there. I don't know necessarily, I mean, I'm a, I'm a really, uh, I'm a doubting Thomas when it gets to this, down to this kind of thing. I have to, I have, to have some kind of proof. But uh, is that, a, is that a, a, a typical thing? Do most people are willing to accept Sort of yeah, yeah, they are. The in fact, I, I get very good reactions from my clients, and, and, and most of them, when they're finished a session, they'll say, wow, that was great. I feel so good. I, some will say, 
this has really changed my life. I get comments after the fact in emails from them saying it was great and, uh, and, and you really, the answers I got really solved some of the mysteries in my life. And, and, uh, and in some cases where they had physical ailments that were healed, they'll say, you know, that was great, wonderful. And uh, you know, they're, very, they're very happy. So uh, do you have a, a sort of an explanation of, of how this works or do you, I mean, I've got some kind of an explanation in my mind because I've read a lot of near-death experiences that we do have a consciousness that can be put in a, in a higher level, a causal plane is how I mm -hmm. think of it, and that we can affect changes in the, in the material level. And would you say that that's true of, of quantum healing? That, that, you can, that you actually affect a physical change sometimes merely by hip, putting somebody into a hypnotic state? Yeah, it can occur. The practitioner doesn't do any healing or any changes. They just facilitate the higher okay. self from doing it for the person because the higher self could basically do anything. I mean, they can, I mean, I haven't had any really serious health issues uh, for my clients, but Dolores Cannon has had examples where somebody will walk into her session uh, on crutches. They can't walk. They leave the session and leave the crutches behind or they have, they're scheduled for major surgery after the session and the higher self says, we'll heal you, they don't need the surgery anymore. I've had a couple of minor cases where one lady was, uh, she had an inexplicable pain in her leg that she's had like for ages. And the doctors can't figure out, there's nothing wrong with you, you know, you know why are you having this pain? Ask the higher self and the higher self says, it's because her spine was slightly misaligned in one place. And I said to the higher self, well, can you fix that for her? And they said, sure. And so after she came out of the trance, she said to me, um, when the higher self said they were fixing it, she could feel things in her spine moving. Wow. And, and, and the pain was gone. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. And so those are just, but, but you know, it, it doesn't always work if, if uh, it it's only works if, the, if it's appropriate for you. So if you have a physical ailment that you chose to, to have uh, before you were incarnated as part of your life challenge, they won't change that. They won't, they won't me mess with your life plan. But if it's something that just sort of came um, uh, otherwise, uh, then they can help you. As long as you, as long as the client believes they can do it, it'll happen. That's very interesting. Garnet has written four books, and I've read, I've got one of them. I'm getting the rest of them now to read because I read Dancing on a Stamp, and it's just so fascinating. You can order them from his website if you're interested in these things. And I'd, uh, if you could just tell us this uh, a little bit about Let's see, the after Dancing on the Stamp, is there a dance of a Dancing Forever? No, that's the last one. Dancing that's Forever with Spirit. Dancing Forever with Spirit. Okay, so Astonishing Insights from Heaven. Do you want to just give a brief sure. overview of that? Sure. After I'd finished the manuscript for my first book, Dancing on the Stamp, Albert disappeared out of my life for a little while, and then he suddenly reappeared. And I, and I woke up one night in my, in my bed, and I could see this ghost-like ethereal figure standing in the doorway of my bedroom. When it moved closer to my bed, I could see... It was my old friend, Albert, except now he was in astral form. Oh. Okay. So I said, Albert, hi, what brings you here? What, what's up? And he said, I'm coming to take you on a series of astral trips to the spirit side, to other places on our planet, other places in the universe, because I want you to write about what you see and hear in your next book. And by the way, you're going to write three more. <laughs> it sort of took me back. <laughs> so then, so then uh, he took me, he literally grabbed my astral hand and pulled my astral body out of my physical body. I turned around and looked at my physical body was still asleep in bed. Is that the first time you'd done yeah, that? Yeah, first time. Okay. Very first time. So you had assistance the first time. Oh, oh. That's nice. Yeah, you know, yeah, no, actually all the times. I've always been with Albert when I'm uh, astral travel. So anyway, we float up through the ceiling, up through the clouds. He lets me sort of stop at a very high point above our beautiful planet to look, look back on it. Amazing how beautiful our planet is from that perspective. It's mm -hmm. like a jeweled pendant hanging in the inky blackness of space. So then he said, come on with me. And we went through a shimmering doorway to the spirit side. And there um, I, I ended up in a, in a beautiful meadow, like incredibly beautiful, like more so than any, any place you could ever see on earth, like lush green grass and trees and a thousand different kinds of wildflowers. We walked mm. up a hill and the other side I saw a group of souls waiting for me, a group of people. They, were, they looked like humans. As I got closer, my heart skipped a beat because I could see it was my mother, my father, uncles and aunts, and my brother who had already passed away. And so they were there to greet me give me warm hugs and, and, and wrap me in unconditional love. And, and that was, Albert said, that's a preview that all of us will have when we transition back to the spirit side, we'll be met by a welcoming group. So he gave me a preview of it because I'm, I'm still, obviously I wasn't dead yet. And then we went off to the, a beautiful white city there called Aglaia, where we ended up meeting with uh, uh, this wonderful council called the Council of Wise Ones. And that was my first trip. Um, the, the second 
uh, the third, yes, the, the third and fourth books are also detail my astral travels with Albert, different places, speak to different people. Um, and, and so I, I basically, uh, I, I had a number of astral adventures with him and, and, and my books described what I saw and what I heard. So Dan, so the Heavenly Bliss is the third book. That's the last one, the fourth oh, one. The, oh, then Dance of oh, Eternal Rapture. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, you're right. Dance of Heavenly Bliss That's is the, the third, third one. Yeah. Then Dance of yeah. Eternal Rapture. That's the fourth Ageless book. Ageless Wisdom from the yeah. Spirit. Well, I, I haven't read them yet, but I know from reading, the, having read the first one that, that I'm going to be really interested in these. And I'm just fascinated with, with all of these things that are, that are going on. I mean, I've spent, uh, my wife and I have spent a lot of time watching Dolores Cannon videos on mm -hmm. YouTube, and that's how we found you. We watched mm -hmm. some uh, other QHHT practitioners, mm -hmm. and uh, we both just decided that we wanted to do that and see what it was like. And so we called you and set up appointments, and my wife actually went first. But, but it's so nice to be able to do this right here locally on Vancouver Island, I can tell you, because a lot of people have to travel. And it's something that you can really only do in person, right? You can't just do it on a Skype call. Yeah, that's right. That's one of the, the strict rules that Dolores set was it has to be done in person, not by Skype or by phone. So that there's a sort of a geographical limitation in terms of, you know, ah. people could access to me. Either I go somewhere or they come here. But, you know, I don't really travel around that much, and so it, it's a limiting factor. Mm -hmm. But it's really not. I mean, it's, it, it, as long as you can find somebody, then you're in good shape. And there seem to be more and more of you QHHT practitioners around. I've looked on YouTube, and they're just yes. full of them now. So who was Dolores Cannon? Why don't you tell us a little bit about her? Because she's the one that started this, right? Yeah. Well, she started off just uh, almost by accident, just doing hypnosis. And, and she, I'm not sure where she took her training from, but it was the basic sort of, I want to quit smoking, I want to lose weight kind of clients. Who, and she was doing that through hypnosis. And then almost by accident, one day she was regressing somebody back to uh, uh, their childhood in this life to find out if there was a problem. And all of a sudden they flipped even further back into a different life. And so she thought this was interesting. So she learned about how to regress people. And then l later on, she found out that uh, every once in a while, she'd be talking to the person who was under hypnosis. And all of a sudden, it seemed like there was somebody else coming in and speaking. And then she uh. soon figured out that this was their higher self. And so she developed a technique whereby uh, the practitioners can access the higher self, ask the questions. And so and she developed this over a period of 40 years. She did thousands and thousands of sessions. She was very good at it. Um, and uh, unfortunately, she passed away and uh, well, she transitioned to the spirit side in October of 2014. So she's written a number of books also on this background information on this, hasn't she? Yeah, absolutely. She's written, I think, 19 or 20 books. Oh, my gosh. And most of them have uh, deal with her sessions. And there's, they're all different in terms of what, what, what was learned from the sessions. And, this, and, and it really, she just picks out the, the higher self part, the good, the good part of the sessions. And, and it, they're transcribed from the recordings, and that's what's in her books. And it's written, very fascinating, some really, uh, you know, off, way, out of this world kind of stuff that came out of some of these sessions. So she's really a very well-known author if she's written that many books. Absolutely, yeah. She has, has a great following, um, and she's been all over the world giving lectures and, uh, and doing sessions and training people. Um, and, you know, she was very energetic. She died, I think she was in her mid-80s. So and she was still up and about. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Well, that's fascinating. Do you have a, a particular, if people are interested in this, do you have a particular recommendation for one of her books that's particularly good? Because I imagine that, I mean, for me, uh, I, I went to church for, 50, for the first 50 years of my life, and nobody talks about uh, reincarnation or, you mm -hmm. know, astral travel or any of that stuff. And I've, I've had my own experiences since then. But uh, I'm just wondering if there's anything, you know, to sort of, get people into it that's not too... Uh... <laughs> well, yeah, I, I suggest a, a couple of her earlier books. Uh, one is called Five Lies Remembered. Another one is called Between Life and Death. And that sort of mm. sets the stage for people who aren't really familiar with this area and they can kind of get, get the basis for what, you know, where she's coming from. Some of her later books are really quite... Uh, uh, in, they're quite complicated, quite esoteric. And so I wouldn't advise people jumping into one of the later books, but start off with one of her earlier books and that will give you a good, a good grounding in terms of what she did. She sort of builds on the, the past. Uh, oh, yeah. I think I read an earlier book, and you know, it was, uh, she talked about helping people quit smoking and things. And it's really funny that, that you would go from something as mundane as just you know, breaking habits to all of a sudden you're, it gets to be uh, 
the, you know, your whole worldview, this has got to have just completely rocked your world. Oh, oh totally, yeah, totally. And, 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 and you can see the development. If somebody's really anxious, they could start at her first book and move all the way through. You can see how things developed. Mm -hmm. um, but but it, was right, it was done like over a period of 40 years and, uh, and she's really perfected it. She started teaching it uh, maybe eight or 10 years ago. So there are a number of QHHT practitioners and, and there's a very set guidelines. We have to follow it according to how she did it. We're not supposed to vary. And okay. I tell you, it works. It really does. I can vouch for that. Mm -hmm. It does work. Okay, so one of the things uh, that I just wanted to delve into a little bit, if we have this sort of thing, or there, QHHT isn't the only past life regression therapy either. I've heard of that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a Dr. Newton, I think, who, mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, Life Between Lives. I think mm -hmm. I read that, and that kind of got me into this, so I had a little bit of an introduction yes. before. But then you have people who are getting abducted by UFOs and you have people who are, uh, you know, doing, having a near-death experience. And those, to me, are very convincing because the, the, some of the things that happen to them when they come back, they're cured miraculously of, a, of something that they would normally be dead from. So what do you think is going on on this planet, Garnet? Because we don't talk about any of these things seriously. We pretend that the people who are uh, subject to these things are sometimes nuts. Well, it, it's getting better, actually. I mean, like uh, 30 years ago, I, I wouldn't have written my books, and, and if I did, nobody would have read them, and I certainly wouldn't be having an interview with you about this topic. But things are developing. More and more people are becoming spiritually aware. They're asking all the big questions. A lot of them are sort of uh, rejecting the religion they were taught when they were youngsters and, and are looking for new answers to uh, you know, the big questions in life. So there's a lot of people searching. And, and, and so it, it's, it's, it's becoming better and better and better. And, and there's still a lot of people if I talk to them about what I do, who will roll their eyes, but there's a lot more people who will say, that's great, wonderful, good for you. I wonder if we're gonna hit some tipping point because this seems to me to be, once you, once you have this realization that you're not your body, I think we're all afraid of death. Mm -hmm. And so once you have this realization that I am not my body and I, I, even if I'm dead, I'm still, my consciousness still is alive, I mean that, I, I know I got out of my body by myself accidentally a, a couple of times and then I started working on it and I know it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, but that changes you forever. I mean, you can't, it's not a belief, it's an experience that you've had and nobody can take away your experience. So. No, no, for sure. And, and, and once you sort of get to the point where, and to understand what Albert has told me and by, you know, by reading, say, my books, then you're never going to be afraid of death again. You know, it's just a transition. You're moving from one room to another because we're all eternal souls and, and we go on forever. And we're here just to have a human journey to learn and experience things that we want for our evolution as a soul. And we chose to come here, chose our life. So you can never be a, you can never be a victim. You can never say, why did God put me here? Or why did the universe put me here? You put yourself here. Right. And so whatever life you, you, the, the, you, the you're into, you planned it before you were born, plus you change it as you go because of your free will actions. So, it's, it's sort of like you're the author of your own movie, so to speak, and uh, that's the way you should look at it. Well, I, I've been doing this show for, since 2012, and it is frankly sometimes depressing to come out of here and hear what's going on in the world because there's just so much bad stuff going on. Right. But this really gets me excited. It gives me great hope because I, I just think, well, that's the point. The point is to get everybody to wake up and take a look at all these things. So. I kind of think that that's what we're, we're going through, some kind of an amazing uh, transformation and waking up of everybody. And before long, everybody's, this is gonna, just gonna seem normal to everybody to access your past lives. And I mean, a lot of things go away when you realize, when you regress to a past life and you realize, oh gee, I was a woman in one life. Or, exactly. And, and uh, I mean, one of the things that, that uh, my wife and I came away with in our uh, in our sessions was that we'd been married previously mm -hmm. and uh, that was interesting but the sexes were reversed and I just found that fascinating and it, it didn't even matter if it's not true to me what it made me what it did was it gave me a different camera angle on how I talk to my wife <laughs> exactly. and, and what our relationship is and everything else so I just think that uh, you know if you start off with this uh, just ease if you like this kind of thing that that doing something like this which is fairly gentle I mean I have friends who have taken ayahuasca and all sorts of other things which are not quite as gentle as this mm -hmm. you can still get there 
by doing these things and really change your consciousness and find out who you are and access that deeper level. So you, you uh, agree with that assessment, to, right? Totally. It's, I mean, it, it, it is a very gentle way of getting into it. I mean, you, you don't, there's no uh, bodily harm. There's no, nothing that'll make you ill or sick right. or anything. I mean, it's, it's designed to make you um, aware of the fact that you have past lives and that you have a, this uh, higher, your higher self is there with you all the time, you know, on your side, trying to coach you and, and, and give you the good answers. And, you know, at the end of the day, you have nothing to lose. I mean, you can believe it. That's great. If you don't believe it, well, you've, you know, you've lost four hours out of your day. Yeah, right. Okay, so we have about a minute left. Is there anything else you want to just say about th this topic? Or N No, I just, I mean, uh, uh, if people like, would like to have a session, they can go to my website and they can just schedule it online. And, and these sessions go for anywhere between four to five hours. I'll uh, put your website up. On yeah, the and, my, my, yeah and, and you just click onto my QHHD website. If you want information about my books, I have a book website, um, and there's you can get information on all my books. You can read an excerpt. You can get right to the online bookstores like Amazon and Barnes and Noble and the rest. Click right on there, and you can get right to a point where you can buy my books. And uh, and I, I also have Facebook and all the other social media sites. So all the information is there. And if anybody has a comment or a question, send me an email. It's on my website. Great. Well, thank you very much. This is been a really fascinating topic for me. It's one of my favorite subjects because I really like to think that uh, humanity is headed in a good direction and, and that we're all waking up rather than we're headed for some mass destruction. <laughs> so I really appreciate your coming, taking the time and coming on the show and talking to us. So thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum and, Forum and we'll be back. Mm -hmm.